begin to you know see us reopening the dine-in experience um it, it's going to be interesting to see you know loyal customers uh, there's going to be some i'm sure that will come back immediately and some that will be a little nervous in the beginning and you know, so it's going to be really interesting to to see that feedback from them as to what you all are doing and what we'll talk about today and what's important to them but uh, i think that um, certainly if it's somebody like me I'm ready to go back to fine dining restaurants and other restaurants and chain restaurants as well. It's like I, I made a comment to somebody the other day. I said, you know, they're going, oh, do you, will you feel comfortable going to a fine dining restaurant if somebody has a mask on? I'm like, I don't care if they serve me in a hazmat. <laughs> you know, like, I'm going back. You know, <laughs> they can have every kind of glove they want on. If they can't open the line, I will. You know? So, uh, so we're looking forward. Obviously, we're careful. We've been extremely careful. We um, didn't really go to other people's houses or have anybody come to our house. Uh, we were fortunate in Florida to be able to get outside and exercise. So we've been, um, you know, out doing that. But uh, I think people here, I, will, I can only speak for Central Florida, this is the longest I've gone without travel in probably 30 years. But I, people here have been, in, in most areas, have been very, very uh, cognizant and careful. And when we're walking, you know, people either walk in the street to stay away from you or go to the opposite side of the sidewalk. Um, but I'm really happy to see that. And I think that's what we all need to do to work together, not only on this, but when we get into phase one or two uh, into this recovery, uh, it's going to be interesting to, uh, you know, for all of us to communicate together, help each other and, uh, and work through this. Yeah, and Kevin, I think we're doing pretty well. We have, um, I think, over 90 people have joined already, and it'll just be a, a trickle from here. So uh, I don't know if you want to kick us off with some introductions. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is just mention you know, who you are. Most people know you probably anyway. I looked through uh, the list yesterday, and it's really exciting to see how many you know, friends and people that we've known over the years are with us today. Uh, but Jack Lee, thanks. I want to say thanks, too, because Data Central obviously is helping us quite a bit. Um, in this and putting this together. And I did, you know, jokingly say to him today, because every time we've worked together over the years, many times there's been a new title, but he's still haiku master. So of data essential. Uh, Donald Moore is the chief culinary officer and the executive vice president of kitchen operations for the Cheesecake Factory. But also they have nine other brands that he's working on. He made a comment about wearing 75 hats yesterday. So and I think that's probably not an exaggeration. Um, Mike Turner is the Vice President of Culinary Supply and Supply Chain for Walk-Ons Enterprises. Very interesting company, and I think you'll find uh, a, a real unique, um, you know, information from him on what they're doing and the entrepreneurial style company that they are. And Carl Kaufman, who's the Director of National Accounts for Genio Turkey Store. Carl and I talked many years ago when they went through the avian flu and some of the things that happened around that. and. You know, what he had to do to work back into, you know, getting the supply chain back to where it needed to be and the problems that come with that. So I thought his knowledge on this uh, coming into where we're going to be in the next few weeks, hopefully, uh, is going to be really, really good. So, again, thanks to the four of you. For the most part, um, we're going to I'll just stay in the back and I'll try to pay attention to the chat. So if there's any good questions, we'll bring that in. But uh, Jack, I want to turn it over to you. And thanks again. Yeah, great. So I'm, I'm going to share out my screen for uh, a moment, and we're actually going to do today's conversation in four parts. Uh, I'll share uh, a few slides with the content to get some of our thinking going, and then we're going to turn over to the, the panel for conversation. So uh, the four parts are guest experience, um, then menu and culinary, and then operations and staff, and then finally community. So I'm going to go ahead and share out my screen and take us through just a few thoughts as it relates to uh, the guest experience. So I think you probably all see my screen right now, and I will um, reduce this uh, when these slides are done so we can see all of our beautiful faces full screen again. Um, but I, I just wanted to take us through some of the research that Data Central has already done that I think are important highlights to kick off today's conversation. Um, one, and this is something that's just so important, is if you want to think about in the short term how people perceive coronavirus, just remember this. They tend to fear it because it's invisible to them. It's non-quantifiable. It cannot be detected. You cannot buy a special set of glasses and see it flying in the air. So you sort of feel like it might be anywhere all around you, which can potentially introduce a layer of par paranoia. At least initially, customers and guests will be paranoid in some way. And that's okay, right? That's just a very, very natural thing because 
essentially you think almost anything could potentially infect you. And this um, aligns very well with what people tell us. You know, we, sur we survey consumers on this and they say, you know, going to a restaurant potentially is like stepping into a minefield where there are landmines absolutely everywhere. Like every little activity or action you might do could be another potential point of infection. All these things that we do, uh, you know, that we take for granted, it's like, oh, wow, that could get me. Probably one thing that we've all um, come to realize early on in this process is I never realized how often I touched my face until I was told to stop touching my face. And then you're like, oh, my God, I'm touching my face like 20 times a minute. And it becomes really hard to avoid at some point. Inside of a restaurant, it's everything. 78% of people think that touching a door handle is going to increase their chance of contracting the virus. Engaging in self-serve buffet-style food, almost 80% say it's going to do it. Using public restrooms. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. These aren't small numbers. These are actually pretty big numbers of people that think that these are potential infection points. So remember that that dining room, because you can't see this thing, um, customers will initially err on the side of caution and you want to put them at ease in as many of these interactions as possible. You cannot be overly paranoid in how you approach this issue. It's better to be overly paranoid initially so the customer doesn't have to be. Don't leave them guessing. Uh, when, when consumers tell us what matters to them most and why they pick a restaurant these days, historically it's been taste and then convenience. Right? Those were the, the it, it, you know, historically been taste, convenience has caught up in recent years. Um, now it's not. Like taste drops way down the list. And then number one, by, by a mile, is cleanliness and sanitation. This has never happened before. This is a new thing. Cleanliness and sanitation is not normally why people pick a restaurant in any normal time. Here it's number one, and there's not even a close number two right? 43%. And there's a huge 13% gap before you get to the next thing. So if you think about your messaging, and there is no right answer to this, but should the messaging be about the great food and the taste and the quality and, and all those things that have traditionally been embedded in our messages? Or should the messaging lead with an assurance of cleanliness and sanitation? Um, you could go either approach, I think, but just know that in the back of the consumer's mind, they need to make, they need, this is absolute table stakes. They have to know that they're going to be safe in the environment. And there's going to be doubt, right? If, if they don't hear it, they'll probably have some layer of doubt. One of the ways to address this is through a process that we call overt sanitation. Uh, be over the top, but more, most importantly, be visible in what you're doing. D don't just have a note uh, posted someplace that says, you know, we sanitize um, every hour or every night or whatever it might be. Um, have it so people can see this process happening, right? Think back to the notion of open kitchens when they, those first became popular, right? The idea that you could see your food being made told you that your food was actually being made and there was a, a chef driving that process. The same thing applies to sanitation. Do it in front of the customer. Let them see it. Let them experience it as it happens. Uh, be over the top for now. Perhaps eventually this will not need to be the case. And perhaps it won't even take very long until we get to a point where this doesn't need to be the case. But at least initially, this will provide a very important level of assurance. The other thing, um, and some of you may have seen us talk about this in the past, but I think it's really important. You know, as brands, we've traditionally thought of uh, our, our job being to get food to the customer, right? We get our food to the customer, they got it, our, our job is basically done. Uh, and we want to ensure the best possible experience up until that point. Uh, what we may not realize is that as a result of the pandemic, consumers are engaging in all sorts of very odd behaviors after they get the food from us, whether it's takeout or delivery. They're doing this strange dance of different behaviors from extreme hand washing to disinfecting the, the delivery bag and all the packaging inside, having to do their own, uh, use their own silverware. Um, transfer the food from the, the packaging to their own plates, reheat the food to, to potentially use heat to kill any, you know, clinging on vir you know, viral fragments. There's a whole lot of stuff they're doing, uh, and it's not necessarily a convenient proce process for them. You want to think about our job as being taking the consumer all the way through the consumption 
experience, not just the receipt of the food itself, but going all the way through consumption. So there's probably a lot around packaging that this impacts, right? One thing we know is that consumers think that hot food is safer to eat than cold food because heat potentially kills the virus. Um, one thing we also know is that even before the pandemic, one of the biggest things that consumers wanted with delivery and packaging is to have ovenable packaging. Imagine a package where you get your delivery bag or whatever's inside, and you just throw the whole thing right into an oven, not have to unwrap stuff or unfold stuff or transfer stuff, just throw the whole thing in, reheats your food for you so you have nice hot food anyways. But in this case, maybe it has the extra benefit of make, making people feel more comfortable about the virus. Um, there's a lot of things that can be done, and packaging is probably you know, one of the most important levers that we could pull right now. But if your product is getting to the consumer in a way where there's like 20 different containers inside that delivery bag or that takeout bag, just know that you will have some of your customers literally taking like a paper towel and soap or something and scrubbing down each one of those 20 containers before they feel it's safe to eat. Whether that's warranted or not, I guess that could be up for debate. But what's not up for debate is that some people are actually taking the time to do this behavior and I can't imagine it's a particularly fun thing to do. Like if you didn't like doing the dishes, I'm pretty sure you don't really enjoy doing this either. So how do we make it easier for them in a way that puts them at rest? Do we combine more things together in a single package? So there's just one thing to deal with. I don't know. I mean, there's, it's going to be different for each one of your brands, uh, but something to think about. So if walking into a restaurant is like walking into a minefield, getting a delivery or takeout bag is like having a live hand grenade that you then need to diffuse as quickly as possible. Uh, so perhaps we can diffuse it for the customer in advance. Um, nearly 80% of consumers say that a restaurant's cleanliness will always matter more to them now than it did before. Uh, I think this is a pretty believable statistic. So um, what we've seen in our data is there's a really, really wide gap in the cleanliness ratings uh, between brands. Uh, I think the highest rated brand is like, uh, I'm paraphrasing, is like an 81 and the lowest is like a 35. Like it's a pretty broad range among top chain restaurants. Uh, this becomes a, a gap that many brands will need to start closing very, very quickly. So um, putting an effort, not just for short term sanitation, but the longer term perception of you just having a, a clean spotless restaurant will be all the more important. So with that, I'm gonna unshare my screen and open this up for conversation. Um, Donald, uh, Michael, Carl, I don't know if, uh, if you wanted to kick off any discussion around any of the points we just talked about or guest experience overall. Ev, do you want us to just, sort of just go like a brief little update of what we're doing in our companies? Yeah, what are, yeah what, are you, what are you doing on as it relates to guest experience and making people feel safe maybe is where yeah. we could start? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, Kevin and Jack, thanks for putting this together because I think in the in the business we're in, it's all about taking care of each other. It's already hard enough and the work is hard enough and the returns are so small uh, that the fact that we can collaborate like this and be competitors is everything our business, what's special about our business. And to all of us that have had friends and family members and people that we've cared about and worked for our company for 20, 30 years that have been furloughed or lost their jobs because of a virus and not because of performance, I think we're all very committed to doing our absolute best operationally <laughs> And from an R&D perspective, get these people's jobs back to them. So that's what we're driving. We're driving. I think um, from the guest experience, I think you nailed it, Jack. I think that we're looking, we just spent some time with our founder, David Overton, at his house last week, going through every point of the guest experience. And where we've always, he's always said, it's the food, stupid. And we start there. He, he led the whole conversation off with, um, he's been doing this for four decades, about how are we optically going to make sure that we're perfectly clean to the guests? And how are we going to make sure that, you know, we, we, we even on social media, we're sharing what we're doing to clean and the, the steps that are happening in the restaurants, which we've never done before. We're not that type of company. And I think for the guests, um, we're about to open up two restaurants in Atlanta. Most of our restaurants are open right now. And we've been doing off premise in all of them. And obviously our sales have been hit, but we've, we've, we've evolved every day with the off premise or curbside or anything. But um most of our, our guests, uh, what we're trying to figure out in Atlanta is how they want to touch every point of the restaurant, whether it's the front door. We had an hour-long debate around paper menus, old menus, 
directing a younger guest to their phone, to the menu? Would a 75 year old guest want to go on their phone for a menu? How can we scan QR codes so you can see the menu? And then there's a slew of complexity with that because you have different beer and liquor everywhere and wine everywhere. So we're working through really every single facet. We're starting with the guests before we figure out anything else about how they can feel safe and clean and really that the place is more fun and the energy is higher than anywhere and than any time it's ever been. And I think that another example of something I brought up the other day is like the front desk person. You know, usually yeah. you walk into a, a nice restaurant and you see a beautiful smile and you're greeted and uh, you know, and that's so important to hospitality and making people feel at home and like you're there to serve them. How are we gonna do that with a scary hospital mask on that person? So could we put a shield on that staff member? Could we have a mask that's a little bit softer and looks a little bit nicer? I think that for us, uh, we, have, we know that people wanna get out. Even some of the restaurants that opened up in Georgia over the past couple of days, we're hearing our capacity already. Um, but how can we make our guests feel safe first and foremost? So we're, we, we're, we're going to really, really exhaust our efforts on that right now. That's what yeah, we're really I, working I, on. I love what you said about examining every potential point of contact in that dining experience, right? You, you know, everything someone can touch, going to the bathroom, the whole thing. How did you actually identify those points of contact? Did you sort of simulate, you know, your own dining experience and see what happened or? Um, we did as an, exec, and as an executive team. And then we included some operators because we need the people that are doing the job more importantly than the people that are not. Uh, we reviewed every touch point that a guest would have to go through. Grabbing the bathroom door, sanitizing, washing their hands, how they're going to open the bathroom door, how they're going to touch the menus, how we're going to grab dishes off the table, when to take the dishes, the way to not hand somebody a Tabasco bottle. We're going to pour the Tabasco in the kitchen, bring it out in a little ramekin. Um, if we hand somebody a bottle, if they, some people are very... Um, really want their stuff to come out of the bottle, we'll wipe it down in front of them. How we're going to bring somebody another fork, for example, if they had a salad and they want another fork for their entree. Um, we've gone through every single point. I'll give you one example that sort of just went right over our head is we're very big on tasting food for our guests before it goes to our guests. Could you imagine our, we have all glass windows in all of our kitchens that you saw some chef or kitchen <laughs> manager eating your french fry or eating your pasta that we've done for 40 years. I mean, I think people would jump through the glass and attack you or take a picture of you and put it on social media. So now we're going to taste everything before it's made behind the walls yep. in a very sanitary way. And we have to stop that process. I mean, there's so many little things that people are going to be sensitive to that they weren't six weeks ago. And we're going to mess up and we're going to fail, but we're going to react very, very quick. But we have examined every single touch point for our guests with their own hands, their own eyes, and how to make them feel better today than they did six weeks ago. I love that. And Michael, are you doing anything that we might find surprising as it relates to safety or the broader guest experience? Well, you know, it's, it, it's, it's interesting because what Donald's talking about is his line of sight and eye for detail, which Cheesecake Factory has proud of itself on for years. And I remember working, when I worked with Cheesecake Factory and Donald, we would sit down and get line of sight of every table what they're looking at, how they see, can they see into the kitchen, and what does that look like? So for us, we know today that the guest is a lot more experienced on safety and sanitation than they were four or five weeks ago. We've all learned a lot, and they've learned more. They've certainly learned what we've known, but now they're going to hold us to a higher level of, of accountability. We, so we've really worked online aside as well. Secondly, we've got a really good, strong social media presence about what we're doing to clean our restaurant, to keep them detailed, to keep them organized, and make sure that Every picture that we take or every video we post on social media, our guests know that we have that safety and sanitation first, first of mind. Um, we're doing online payment. So we've, we've gone ahead and made the initial investment now to do online payment, online menus. So when you come into our restaurants, it's on your phone. You can scan it. You can click to our menu and you can do some of those things as well. Um, uh, we're, we're doing uh, Kitchen Scratch TV. So we have monitors in all of our restaurants now. Instead of highlighting some of the culinary dishes that we have, we're going to start highlighting some of the safety and sanitation practices, dropping those little tidbits in so the guest knows and can see that playing out on screen of what we're doing. We ramped up EcoSure really, or, uh, really early on in this process. We, uh, we had EcoSure as a partner to help manage our restaurants from a safety and sanitation perspective, but we also engaged them about four weeks ago to hit our restaurants once a week and really focused on delivery and to-go procedures because we knew that was going to be a real highlight. 
And we've asked Ecolab to come back in and reservice our restaurants, chemical towers, our dish machines to get everybody recalibrated of what's going on. We have additional online training that we've pushed out to all of our staff and all of our managers throughout this process to keep them really up to speed. And I think SurfSafe has done a great job offering some online classes around that in the COVID-19. And then lastly, we've looked at our kitchen design and how this impacts us with the restaurants moving forward. You know, we have 150 restaurants to open over the next six years. and We have 12 more to open this year. And we can't do anything about those designs, but we had just gone to the, the glass kitchens as well, which today in our bulldog design, we've changed that now. And we're looking at how this impacts social distancing, how we place tables, where we place tables, our floor charts, and then in the kitchen, do we have enough square footage to potentially see some new rules and regulations coming in from the CDC or the health department? It's actually sort of amazing. I mean, we're entering basically week seven of this madness. And just, I mean, for both of you, just the amount of things you've already figured out how to do is really sort of incredible in such a short period of time. Like in normal, in normal times, sometimes it takes a long time to do a very small thing. You've done so much in a compressed period of time. Just do you think this is going to change the pace at which you do things long run as well? Is it going to be faster decision making even after the pandemic? Yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, one, I think we had some great learnings in 2008 and 2009 about restaurant companies not reacting quick enough. Yeah. And I think that that, uh, we talk about that internally a lot that we're not going to make that mistake again. And we have a little bit of a playbook, a different playbook. One was a financial crash. Another one is a pandemic and, and it's just way scarier. But um, so I think that we are reacting quick. I think that one of the things that and this is not the way we've historically thought as a company and even for myself is uh, I've sort of always looked way farther out, probably to a fault. But this is a really a day at a time. Like, you know, we had a great discussion around kitchen design yesterday in our company as well and about how to design kitchens that can deal with maybe 30 to 40 percent off premise. Then this morning I wake up at five o'clock and there's a potential vaccine and the stock market's up 500 points and our stock's up $4. And I'm like, well, maybe we, we don't need to do that. You know, so I think that uh, it, it's a little bit of an art and a science right now, Jack, to be honest with you to say, what do you believe is thematic? Because I'm big on data and, uh, and what is changed. So we are, we do think that off premise is not, it's already was on an upward climb and the data supports that. So we should be looking at better packaging, less touch points on packaging, food that travels better, design still, even if the sales go from 17% to 30%, all that's probably worth the investment. We're also being trying to show some restraint and, uh, and not get too far ahead of ourselves and really focus on the guests that's in the restaurant right now um, because it could, you can get distracted and uh and be all over the place and what really the restaurants need right now the operators as you're talking about the guests is they need to feel the staff needs to feel safe cared for they have enough sanitizer enough mask enough gas and it's hard to to stay focused on that versus sort of thinking out a year and what the world could be and that's that's tricky to do because if a vaccine or something happens everything could really shift so uh, let me ask a question and, and 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 tell me if this is a trade secret and that that's okay but you know, I go to a cheesecake factory, let's say, I'm looking forward to getting my, my basket of bread. How will that happen going forward? Is that, has, is that a different experience now? No, so we, um, we will, we've always been very good at that actually with we wash the baskets, we have a duck and gloves and patty pants so nobody's hands ever touch it. We talked about wrapping the bread. We went into a great discussion about this last week um, and I sort of landed on, well, what's the difference of you getting your bread a basket than the salad I'm going to make in the kitchen? And uh, they're both open. The ingredients are both open. They're both being held in kitchens that are things that aren't covered all the time because you're feeding 2,000 people a day. Um, so we've landed that we're going to stick with the same procedures. We'll ask our guests if they want bread, but there's nothing different there. Um, maybe the way the server, your server will have a glove on now, which they didn't before, a mask on. There'll be some of that stuff, but a lot of the thing are, you know, once you get to the restaurants being open, there's no, you can sort of nitpick small things, but your food's going to be made by a cook yep. and all of that's going to be open. And um, like we just like to, not to pile on here, but we did talk about should we um, have covers like in a hotel on top <laughs> of hot and cold entrees and you pull it off so people can see their food. But that's sort of, you know, 
at the end, we will, none of us will be in business because we'll be washing so many dishes yeah. and have so many other materials to serve the guests that none of us will make any money. That's um, a good so setup for a lot of pranks. Like just, the human head appears, you pull yeah. the thing off. Yeah. So, this is a great so we're trying to show some restraint yeah. and see, yeah. you know, listen to what the guest tells us and react quick. Yeah, this is a great segue into the uh, food and you know and menu that we're going to do next culinary menu. Um, yeah. Before we do that, a real quick question to you, Jack. There was somebody asked the uh, the survey that you had in your first segment of this um, about people's opinions. How old is that data? When was the study done? Oh, at the, well, so we'd actually release new research every couple of days. So I think the question was about. Um, if we uh, do, we have a trend line to see if fear is growing or not. Uh, basically, we saw a rapid acceleration in people's fear and resistance to going to restaurants in the first uh, one week for fear, and first week and a half to two weeks for going out to a restaurant. Like you know, before no one was scared to go to a restaurant, then it took about a week and a half before, before people sort of maxed out. That line has essentially held steady since. Uh, uh, the third week of March, all the way until today. It's been fairly constant, roughly about 60% of people say, I definitely avoid eating out. We are seeing what looks maybe like a, sm a slight decline over the last couple of days or uh, last couple of periods, which is the last four or five days, where it's down to, I think, like 57% now. That's still within the margin of error because we're plus or minus 3%. But the optimistic side of me feels like people are opening up a little bit. Uh, the thing that's uh, perhaps not surprising, but still a little sad, is that this is um, driven heavily along political ideology, uh, lines of political ideology, that you have um, people of one political, political persuasion being much more open to going into restaurants than people of another political persuasion. Um, and. Uh, if this continues to be a politicized topic with businesses reopening, I imagine that's just going to continue. Uh, but Carl, before we jump to the next topic, I don't know if you wanted to add anything from a supplier's perspective on safety and guest experience. Um, thanks, Jack. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to make a comment and echo Kevin's comment. Uh, it is remarkable how our industry has come together in total. Um, what I, I see out of this is the ability for all parts of the food delivery system working together. Um, just as a common point, it takes about 275 people touching a turkey to get it to the Thanksgiving table. Wow. And when we think of this, we are all in this together. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a big takeaway. Um, again, echoing some comments. Um, it is a rapidly changing environment and we have to adapt to it. Um, I have seen that in a lot of different ways that we have addressed it with, with uh, our, uh, our employees, our team members and our customers. You know, we're doing the face mask, we're doing the staggered breaks, the plexiglass barriers. Uh, we, we pay our employees 100% if they feel, feel Ill. Ill it's okay for them not to come to work. Uh, we will we'll pay them in full. Uh, we're taking temperatures. Um, I am curious though to know, is there that type of protocol for restaurant uh, people? Uh, kind of a question back to the, to the uh, panelists here. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first on that. You know, what, what we've asked from our staff is we, we auto shipped out uh, temperature logs. We auto shipped out thermal thermometers. We've auto shipped out masks, gloves, everything. And what we're asking, we're taking, we're taking the temperatures of our delivery drivers, our staff, and our managers. We're asking them to record them and keep a record of that. So I think that's something that, that we jumped on relatively early and we'll be continuing to do throughout this process. And I joke, but I think every server should have a button that has uh, their temperature for the day written on it. Hi, my name is 98.6 or, you know, something like that. Uh, okay, we're going to transition to the um, next portion. Yeah. So let's uh, share out the screen again. Apologize, this process is a shade clunky, but uh, you should see my screen now. We're going to talk about menu and culinary, and I have just a, a couple of thoughts to share before we open up the discussion again. Uh, I wanted to provide a historic context around the sizes of menus and what it looked like 
in the, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. You can see in the years leading up to the recession um, over a decade ago, menus got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, we got to a point in 2008 where operators said, you know what, I don't want to have as many products in inventory. I'm going to focus on the core things on my menu that do really well. And they actually started shrinking their menu all of a sudden. However, by late 2009, 2010, a lot of that menu shrink had happened already. And there was actually menu increases among legacy restaurants. At the same time, though, some legacy restaurants went out of business and they got replaced by a new crop of restaurants that had really tiny menus. Instead of a hundred item menu, it was like a eight or nine or 10 item menu. On net, the rise of that new operator doing really interesting things with a really tiny menu caused overall menu sizes to decline. But Keep in mind, legacy restaurants were actually still adding things to their menu at this time. It's just that the new small menus were so small that they overall contributed to uh, an industry-wide decline. Those might have been smaller menus, but those were menus that were driven by innovation. It wasn't just a standard burger or standard this or standard this. It was 10 really interesting things you probably can't find in many other places. So even though we saw a menu, sh uh, menu contraction period, we actually saw an increase in innovation during that time. And as those trends started to take hold, we saw other restaurants then say, you know what? I want to do something with that trend too. I want to do something with gochujang or, uh, or pokey or some of these other things, tremula, uh, et cetera. I want to do something with it. And that's caused all menus to start growing again in recent periods as those trends became mainstream and available more broadly. So that's the context I wanted to start us off with because it is, of course, very likely that we'll see extreme menu contraction in the short term. And perhaps even in the intermediate term, we'll see menus get a little bit smaller. But I think you will see a wave of innovation that, is, um, that dovetails with that which will bring us back to a period of menu expansion again. And even during that time when menus are getting smaller, there will be that wave of innovation that's driving interesting things forward. So here are the stats. Um, in our survey of operators, uh, the one thing they say they're most doing, do, most doing to adjust as it relates to their menu is they're narrowing their offerings. They're focusing on the core. In some cases, this means a slight trim. In some cases, it means I'm taking my 100-item menu and cutting it down to 10 items that I'm just going to do really well right now, and it's my pandemic menu, let's say. And from the consumer's perspective, they're cool with this. Uh, a shrunk menu, a condensed menu is okay as far as the consumer goes for now, right? I mean, you probably want to make sure you cover your favorites so when someone finally comes back into your doors, you have that dish they've been totally craving, but consumers are highly understanding right now. They get that you can't have your entire menu on day one. So 76% say, yeah, that's fine. I'm okay with the condensed menu. I am so sick of eating hot dogs and peanut butter at home. Get me to the restaurant that I love. Um, and I'm willing to accept a whole lot of compromise right now to have that experience. Just let me know that I'm safe. But all the other stuff, I'm definitely willing to compromise on because I need to have a restaurant meal to make me feel normal again. If that means a smaller menu for now, so be it. Whether that ha that's true in the long run is probably more in doubt. I think you can do this initially for a period of time, uh, maybe weeks, months. But eventually, consumers will want um, that dining experience they used to have. So if we go back to 2008, just as, a, as, as sort of a lesson, um, this is a look at chain menu introductions and what percentage of those chain menu introductions month by month going all the way back to, you know, 2006 to, to today um, that were combo and value meals. Uh, we had one month, historically, the numbers like I think about 5% you know, across all, all time, maybe 6%. But we had one month uh, in 2009 where it got up to like 37%. You could see after the recession, as we went into 2009, Chain said, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna focus my new menu releases on value promos, combo meals, things that are all around value proposition to a very, very, very extreme degree. This is true of every single segment. 
right? You could see whether it's QSR, fast casual, mid-scale casual dining, there was a sharp jump in value-based promotions in that 2009 timeframe as a, as a response to the recession. So that's fine, right? And I think it's important that we, we look at value as a way of stimulating short-term demand. What we wanna be careful of is to learn some of the lessons um, from the last recession and make sure we don't repeat some of the mistakes that came out of that period. Uh, I'll give you an example. So this line shows the percentage of all menu items historically that are launched by chains over the last 15 years um, that fall into each one of these categories. So desserts and sandwiches, those are each roughly about 11% of new menu introductions, appetizers a little bit less. Now I'm gonna show you a blue line. The blue line is what it was in 2009 compared to the historic average. So you can see where we had some variance versus uh, the historic number. Uh, we talked about how combo and value meals really spiked up and you can see it very, very uh, prominently here. But here are the other areas where it spiked up, right? Sandwiches became a bigger share of new menu introductions. Mexican dishes, pizzas, and kids entree, which is almost like another version of a combo meal uh, or a value meal in a way. But basically, entree categories spiked up. And then you had a relative decline in things like desserts, um, appetizers and sides to some extent, uh, and beverages. So restaurants then focused their new, their new innovation on entrees and de-emphasized sort of those things that add on and give you check average, like desserts and beverages and, and appetizers. Um, and that might not have been the best strategy in the long run, right? By focusing on the core, it's important that we have, you know, great entrees and whatnot, and that we have great value promotions. But if you don't give consumers a reason to try those add-on items that attach to the check, they're probably not gonna try them, right? So I would argue that we wanna be careful that we still have innovation in these other categories too. The consumer's gonna order, the consumer comes in your door, they're gonna order an entree. That, that's essentially guaranteed. What's not guaranteed are these other parts of the meal. So why not um, actually emphasize some innovation in those areas to, to get you to a better check average? And to the extent that delivery is um, gonna be something that we're gonna continue to see it in heightened proportions for many of your, your brands, um, your food costs are probably higher on entrees than they are in some of these other categories of the menu. Uh, and by the time you pay your delivery commission, entrees may not be that profitable if they're being delivered. Uh, some of these other areas of your menu might be a good place to, to make sure that you're still doing something with. So we track um, basically every new item LTO and what consumers think of each in a system we call scores. And in just the last um, you know, 30 days, all of the brands you see to the right have launched value meal uh, or family meal promotions uh, that we now track in the software as well. That is a whole lot of brands doing a great job and being very, very responsive to the current condition and offering something to address it. But what you want to think about is what is a short-term stimulant versus a long-term strategy? So value will continue to be important, but you can achieve value by lowering the price or repackaging you know, a, an array of items so it's all about the, the savings. Uh, and that's probably your short-term fix, right? That's the short-term stimulate demand, get people coming back. Um, but we run into an, a problem if we take that short-term fix, that short-term Band-Aid, and we mistake it for what a long-term strategy around value should be. It really needs to be about value-based innovation, right? New ideas that have value built into the core of them, not just the repackaging of things that we've maybe already offered and just doing some creative math about what the price should be. You wanna keep these two ideals separate in your mind. One is great for today, and one is what you wanna to aspire to for the long run if you wanna do a uh, value play. You know, we like to say it really is like crack. I mean, you can get addicted to, to price promotions pretty, pretty quickly to the point of um, neglecting other things in your life or your business or your innovation pipeline. It could be disastrous if, if you get addicted to it too early. So keep in mind, there's two ways of approaching it, a short-term approach and a long-term approach. And uh, with that, I'd like to open up the conversation. Uh, so, uh, Michael, I mean, I know you've been doing a lot with family meals. It sounds like they've been really successful. Uh, would you care to share a little bit of that with us? Yeah, I'd love to. You know, on the topic of R&D, that's still ongoing. You know, our founder has not turned that off. 
you know, we were doing some new menu items as of today because we think that we have to continue to stay innovative, and continue to be on the forefront of what we're doing. Us as a brand, we've never done LTOs. We've just, that's something we decided never to do. It's to your point about crack. Once you do that, it's really hard to pull it back. Yeah. And we feel like that that's, that's a road that we'll never go down. And when you're a high growth company, like we are right now, we, we think it's something we just don't need to do. Family meals are something that we would never have done prior to this happening. The three things that we thought were smart plays for us was the family four, which was basically a three to one entree deal for four people which selected apps, entrees, and desserts, some of our signature items. And we felt like that we had to be very careful how we priced that. We couldn't overprice it, but we needed to do it short term to generate some revenue. The second thing was the take and bake menu. We felt like this was an opportunity for us to prepare meals for those, those families that were at home and teaching their kids. And they could take these items home, pop them in the oven for 45 minutes or an hour, and they would have a, a walk-on meal ready to go from scratch, delicious, and they would have all the experiences they Are would you have able in to share which, which one has been more successful or is that sort of a, a trade secret? I'd love to. The family four actually constituted about 15 to 18% of our total overall food sales in the last wow. 40 days. And that's something that we will, we will relaunch, we'll tier it, pricing the right way and, and try and re, re, reinstitute that as we go forward. And lastly, which we thought was a really great idea was we created the Chef Wally Chef Wally menu, and we really paired up, you know, entrees with kids' entrees so we could prepare these items and have the families work at home with their children and educate their kids on not only healthier options, but also cooking processes and cooking techniques to really educate the kids to bring that family together, uh, you know, as you know, bonding, and then also, you know, really give them a delicious and craveable meal. I love hey, that. Mike, there was a question asking about what type of items in this, you know, short, you know, seven week period have been on the increase is a more comfort food, traditional foods. What Maybe we have you can seen a, answer as well. I'd love to, I'll speak for me. I'll turn it over to Donald. We, we've had a huge increase in entree sales. So our crawfish at Tufes, our catfish at our Louisiana platters, where we thought that people would be value driven during this time. We just haven't seen that. Desserts have maintained their, their percentage of sales and so have kids items, but entrees spiked up three to 4%. Uh, which we were shocked to see. We were expecting it would be some of the lower price items like burgers, but that hasn't been the case for us at all. Yeah, I think there was a question about what foods travel well. And we know from uh, research data essentials done that there is a huge disparity in perception about what travels well and what doesn't, right? Uh, pizza, wings are thought to travel well. The interesting thing about this is that consumers are sort of trainable, right? They think wings travel great, but they think chicken entrees don't travel so great. I don't know if there's like a scientific property of wings that makes them travel better, but consumers think there is because we've messaged that to them over and over and over again, that wings are delivery food. We could do that with other things as well. And the, the wrinkle over here is I think historically people would say, I'm going to order something that travels well in the pandemic. When you cannot get your favorite restaurants food any other way, you sometimes say, I want to get food from my favorite restaurant. And I want to get the dish I want to get from there. And the weather travels well is maybe still a consideration, but not the primary consideration. You just want your favorite dish from so-and-so restaurant. Um, so, so Donald, with that as a backdrop, uh, would you say that the Cheesecake Factory menu was going to look um, any or, or very different uh, as your stores start to reopen again, or will it be the same menu? I'd like to first respond. My drinking problem has always been because of the size of our menu. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to be honest, no, you know, it's funny. We, uh, we have 250 menu items. Um, we took 43 items off to help the operations out immediately when the COVID-19 hit, which we've never done. And now those are items that were maybe high in prep complexity and maybe lower sellers, um, but we still need those items. So, you know, I was on the phone with our founder, David Overton, all day long yesterday, and the restaurants that we're going to open back up in Atlanta and Texas and across the country, we're going to have our normal menu. So we're putting all 43 of those menu items back on. Oh, wow. His philosophy, and I don't disagree, has always been to be the place where you can get something, something for everyone, and there's no veto vote. And um, his challenge to all of us is to figure it out and to make it happen. I would say that the one thing I bring up, and there's some questions from some of our great manufacturers and vendors is a little bit of the game right now is what product can you get? How often can you get it? Can they store things like burrata 
our split uh, deboned chickens and keep them fresh in distribution. And the distribution is and logistics part uh, is so unknown right now because of places, the hospitals needing to get their supplies, farmers not dropping stuff in the ground, all the, the plants that have closed down over the past couple of weeks and even that debate between the president today. Um, however, we're seeing, seeing sort of a shift where it was worse probably five or six days ago. Now things are slightly moving into a buyer's market and we're working really, really hard with our partners to be able to, um, to be able to get those products open back up. So we're going back to our normal menu as we open our restaurants. But one thing I would say about the data, which you shared, which I thought was really insightful and accurate for what we saw. In 2008, we created a, what we called a special menu. I don't know if everybody remembers at that time, but that's when Spanish food was starting to make its way into yeah. the United yeah. States. And we created a snacks and small plates menu was sort of like our version of tapas, 495 to 695, about you still have 12 it. items. Yes, still, still have it to this day. Um, and they were, you know, crispy artichokes, fried cheese, stuffed mushrooms, Greek salad. I get your Nashville hot chicken bites all the time. I live in Nashville and it's actually my favorite Nashville hot chicken. So. Right on. Um, so that, that we're going to probably, we're working on something like that again. But in addition to your thing about specialties, which are sort of our entrees, like chicken Madeiras yeah. or chicken piccatas or crusted Romanos or meatloaf, that food skyrockets during this time. Yeah. And those are definitely the mix is roughly the same right now, yeah. but all of those comfort specialty dishes have gone way up. So we're working on um, creating that. And in that card that we created in 2008, had the small snacks and small plates at the lower price, but then we created about eight to nine items that were about 10 to $13 that were specialty dishes. And those items were awesome. And they were awesome for a couple of reasons. They created comfort, value for the guest we do we don't discount we don't offer deals that's just never been in our strategy and i'm not knocking it um and some of the world's best brands do it and some of them are on this phone call right now but that's never been our internal strategy the other thing i've always liked about these special cards when you create lower price point things is they make an, a very nice migration into the menu at a lower price point versus your other items so for example if something on that card was popular um, the card is just dropped down on the table. It's not in our regular menu. When we pull that menu off the table, because maybe the ec economy stabilized a little bit, we can move the popular items into the sections of our menu and they're in their lower price points, which shows some better range for all of our guests, no matter what their sort of income is. Um, but a lot of what we're doing right now is, is we're probably going to work on something similar for this time, focused around comfort, value, and wellness. Um, but there's another way to, another thing that's sort of available today that we didn't have back then, or at least as available, which is social media and a way to sort of share stories and share what we're going to do with that, uh, those items and get them to our guests in a way where we were 10 years ago, they had to show up to our restaurant to understand that we had that. Now we'll be able to tell them instantaneously. What do you think is going to happen to people Instagramming their food? Do you going to see fewer people pulling out their phone and taking pictures? Or do you think there's going to be a flood of that? in the first week it's like look at what i'm getting to eat all of a sudden yeah i think look if you go on and look at all of what our brands are posting right now our guests for all of our companies are so loyal and i don't see that really changing i mean we post one thing about our relationship with doordash and then you have 75 comments within five minutes about i want that louisiana chicken pasta can't wait till i can go back in the restaurant and get it it's my birthday soon um, i don't think that's going to change i mean i think you'll see a lot more gloves and sanitizer <laughs> on the table uh but uh, I think it'll be different. So can I ask, uh, I guess, uh, this is for all three of you, how are you thinking about innovation at this time? So Donald, sounds like you are still thinking about new things, but you were probably working on projects for new products, you know, leading into the pandemic. Did those essentially just all pause and have, or have they been resumed? Is there stuff going on in the background that you're planning for the future or is it just no, get the restaurants open? I think we're going to get, we're not stopping. We're, we're our founder. That's his, it's one of his things is so dear to him. And um, he believes it's what's made us who we are. And um, so we are, we have closed our corporate office as of six weeks ago, where we mainly to protect the safety of people. And, and we're not above the governor of California. Um, and we've tried really hard to just be sensitive to that. However, tomorrow I'm going to open the R and D center back up. So chef Bob and his team will reenter. And I'll be there with them and we'll start working on our menu change for August and to roll out in, in the fourth quarter. And we'll probably have some special cards. And I would say that it's, there's a lot of it that's same, same, but then there's, how do we do something that's fun, 
Instagrammable, of great value that will get people talking about us. Um, and that's, we have a really fun idea that I can't share. Hopefully you'll see in a couple of months. Um, and so we are working on some really creative ways versus just, hey, let's make good food and hope people show up. Are we thinking about more functional foods or super food foods or I I immunity drinks and, and that type of a thing? I think friends. there'll be some, I think there'll be, there'll definitely be some focus around wellness and there'll definitely be some focus around comfort for sure. Great. Michael, did you want to add anything on the innovation side? Well, you know, we, uh, I work for a founder very similar to not anywhere remotely close to David Overton, but he's a, he's a foodie guy and he continues to challenge us on that side. And what we've always done is stay in our lane and keep that unique taste of Louisiana. And that's kind of guided us through this whole process. And we'll continue to do that. You know, our healthy spot for us is six or eight on and six or eight off. Yeah. But I do agree with Donald. Donald, I do think that we are going to start to see some healthier options, but comfort. So uh, a migration of that, I think, is going to be really important as we move throughout this process. Yeah. Uh, Carl, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that conversation. Um, we have found certainly an interest on comfort foods. And I would say like the turkey breast roast, things that can be used for a family of four or five. Uh, we've seen interest there and we've seen interest in retail products uh, being brought into the uh, food service arena, too. So. Uh, yes, there's there's definitely a lot of work going into that area. Yeah, if I can offer like it is a I guess an analogy, a metaphor I guess would be you know it's almost like we're walking down this road and a wall of fire the pandemic just appears before us, and you can either run through the wall and get singed a little bit and just go about your your way, or you could retreat and the fire follows you and eventually just burns you down in a corner. I mean, the idea of going forward with innovation and doing new things, that's the, hey, let's just run through that wall and just keep going. And I think that really is the right approach. Otherwise, you will just get back into a corner at some place, which becomes really painful. Um, we're only halfway through our four topics, and I think we only have seven minutes left. So instead of, uh, you know, taking it through more slides, I figured I could just maybe ask a few more questions for the panel. And maybe if there's a future webinar, we could extend some of this conversation into uh, I'd like to talk about staffing real quick. So uh, many of these brand, many of our brands have furloughed um, very, very large numbers of our staff. The, the research we've done has shown that 18% um, of people in America, right, adults in America, uh, were working but are now either laid off or furloughed. Of those 18% of people, because they are getting some uh, unemployment insurance and perhaps the extra benefit from the federal government, um, but only about half say they would return to their job if it were offered back to them right now. Uh, about 40% say they would wait for their unemployment benefits to run out first before they do that. And about 6%, I think, say they just wouldn't go back at all, period. Um, how are you grappling with the notion of bringing people back in? And are you sort of modeling for that as to what your future staff will look like? Mike, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think what we've done is, is we've created, you know, like a, our founder thinks outside the box. So we've got this new hype video that we've created with the, the gentleman who does the hot video, hot videos for LSU. And we're going to, we're going to launch that next week. This, we live for this campaign and really get our staff back reengaged and back into it. I mean, we've done a great job, I think, preserving our culture and we're a really fun, great place to work. So I think we, we're going to continue to engage our staff on that level along with offering them some other incentives. I think what we're going to find is, is that there's going to be a, a chance for us to upgrade our management teams because I think there are going to be some really talented managers out there available. And then we're going to hope that all of those talented individuals would like to come back and work for, you know, this, you know, this game day experience that we've, that we've created every day and really get those good staff members back. But we will take the opportunity to upgrade our staff levels as well and really go after the best people in the industry. Hey Mike, you uh, also created some other entities during this time, right? The, the uh, partnership with uh, Front Burner and Randy DeWitt and also working with Drew Brees and Feeding Kids. Did that help you keep a lot of staff that you would have furloughed in other, you know, in other words? Well, you know, Drew, Drew Brees came to the table and offered $5 million to feed, you know, the, the school kids here in the state. And so what that allowed not only walk-ons to do, but other brands that he's involved with is keep those people working I mean, up to the tune of, thousands and thousands of dollars a week in additional sales per restaurant. So that's really helped us 
not only get back into the social media spotlight, but do the right thing and to be a good socially conscious partner and, and feed furloughed workers and kids that were really starving because they weren't able to go and get their meals at school. Uh, just to, just to pile on, I mean, I think we've, we furloughed over 40,000 people, staff members, um, and it was terrible. I mean, wonderful people that have built the culture of our company. One of the things that we did was we, we, we kept their benefits for a very long time, which are still active today. We also created a staff meal with about 25 items where all 40,000 of those staff members can come to our restaurant for a hot meal every single day. Wow. And we'll make them a really good meal. And, and a lot of them are taking, I think we're up, up almost up to six or 700,000 meals that we fed wow. to our own furloughed staff. And we'll continue that. Um, you know, I think the, the key thing for us, and a little bit of this is a, a blessing and a curse, is because the, the dining rooms are opening up at 25% or 50% in some states, a lot of the staff don't want to come back because of their, their safety. They have children, they have parents that they don't potentially want to uh, harm as well, or grandparents. And they are, a lot of staff are making more money with the care benefit and unemployment. However, that's not going to last forever, and we know that. So some are going to say, well, I just want to get back and get into it. Yeah. Here's the, the thing I would leave you with. It will be up to the staff member what they want to do. We're going to be 100% supportive of them wanting to come to work. We've sent many bits of communication out about if you don't feel comfortable coming back into that environment, we completely understand. And if there's a job for you here, you will get your job back when you feel that that's uncomfortable. And then we're communicating all the things we're doing to protect them from the guests, from, from each other, with masks, supply masks, and those types of things too. But um, it's going to be a, uh, it will be interesting. To yeah. see, uh, so that, that staff meal thing is brilliant. So you said six to 700,000 meals already, 40,000. So on average, the average person is coming in multiple times a week. So they've stayed sure. engaged with you the entire time, which is probably going to help a ton, I, I would imagine. Which so, is great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's we have a lot, it, we're, we're trying to check in with everybody. I mean, that. Um, it's a, like all of our businesses, they're wildly complex, but it takes a cook in a cheesecake factory six yeah. months to get efficient at what you're doing. Right. So, um, we need, we can't just hire a new staff member and expect right. to be the same productive restaurant company. So let me ask, maybe we'll trail off on this one last question. One thing we see from consumers is they're very willing to tip a little more heavily at the beginning to support uh, all the restaurant workers. Uh, but when you're actually sitting in the restaurant and the check comes, you know, maybe you forget that and you just put it, you sign your, uh, your normal tip amount. Uh, would you support um, reminding the guest uh, to leave a more generous gratuity or is that counter to the guest experience? For us, it would definitely be counter to the guest experience. Okay. Uh, we, we just, it's, you know, David's philosophy since 1978 is to have people come, be able to let loose, not think about washing dishes, engage we nurture yep. bodies hearts minds and spirits we don't want to put any kind of pressure make anybody feel like they're being uh, pressured to upsell yep. to anything um so i think that's something that we would be definitely be against yep uh, uh michael michael you feel the same way we we do and, and there's one thing i do want to give a shout out to for cheesecake factory is that not only are they feeding these furloughed staff members but they're also going out and buying things for their home yeah soap toothpaste deodorant cheese, dairy items. I mean, this is really impressive. Uh, you know, we, we, we feed people as well, but not to that level. I mean, the investment that that company has made to take care of those 41,000 furloughed staff members is impeccable and, 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 and admirable for sure. Thanks, Mike. Hey, I've got something for Carl. There's been a lot of questions, by the way, and some of these were answered in our preliminary calls to lead up to today. So I'll put something on the website in the next couple of days that could hopefully answer some of those. I'm sorry we can't get to all of them. But Carl, to bring you back in, there's a lot of our sponsors are on as well. And I think it'd be good. There's been some questions from them about, and also, you know, Donald and Mike can answer this as well. But, you know, what can manufacturers do to help in this situation coming up? You've had some experience in this. And also you have closed plants. So they're kind of looking for what can we do as a manufacturer to really help our, you know, their, their, their chain customers? Well, I, thank you, Kevin. Um, First of all, I think it, it goes back to my earlier statement about just working together, communicating together um, the needs that are necessary. Second, bringing forth ideas to help build menu items. Um, 
third, uh, working on forecast together because as you ramp up and business goes goes up faster, we've got to have that communication there so we can fill that pipeline for everybody. If we don't do that, you know, all the efforts that go into building that menu, you know, can can be deteriorated very quickly if, if we don't keep that communication line throughout the system. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Can I, can I, can I pile on there? Because yes, uh, I think that was so good and so perfectly said. First of all, help us get sanitizer would be this would be the number one thing anybody. Uh, but uh, seriously, I mean, it's like scary that we can't get enough sanitizer to make our guests and staff feel safe and all the places they need. But the biggest thing for us right now, and we're we're spending about twelve hours a day, not exaggerating, on purchasing, distribution, and logistics. It's sort of taken over our jobs. The mm -hmm. biggest thing is clear communication and collaboration. And like Carl said, so much of this is our vendors have been our vendors for such a long time. But when we get caught off guard and we, they, we get, we get, it always happens on Friday night that we've got $7,000 worth of pork chops that are going to expire in two days, or we don't have buttermilk in Baltimore and Washington, DC for the whole weekend. Those are the things that just crush our companies. And so the forecasting, which is so hard to do right now, we're doing it day to day, but just, clear, honest communication about where the problems are going to be um, are, is the most helpful information because you have to, what's going on in the restaurants right now for the people that are working there, they're going into like frontline workers in the hospitals, they're going into difficult environments every day, very minimal staffing, managers doing hourly functions. And when they get all these calls or their orders come back and they're missing 10 or 15% of things, it just crushes them. And then they're running and it so honest and open transparent communication about shorts subs and all of that is the is the single most important thing right now and and we're trying to get better at that every day because it's very hard very very hard fantastic um i think we're at the top of the hour should we wrap this one up kevin yeah look, do you have any closing comments and i'll say you know a few things at the very end uh, one just a huge thank you for Everyone that's attended spent an hour with us, and a gigantic thank you to, to Mike, Carl, and, and Donald, uh, and Kevin. This has been, I think, an awesome conversation. Um, if you're not aware already, uh, there are a ton of completely free resources available to you on the Data Central website. We have over 35 reports around coronavirus, restaurants reopening, a couple new reports posted every single week. Um, go check it out. It's completely free for you to use. We're doing it as a thank you to the industry. Uh, and again, uh, thanks for spending your time with us today. Thanks, Jack and uh, Carl and Mike and, and Donald. Thank you very much. I thought the information was absolutely perfect. Uh, but most importantly, I want to thank all the other people that were on here today. It's like our members and sponsors, without all of you, this isn't possible, nor are we possible. So thanks for that. I hope you had a lot of key takeaways that uh, will be helpful. I will, like I said, post some other things that will be on the uh, website, either even from some of our uh, calls we've had with our board of directors and information of best practices from there. But uh, please contact us at the national headquarters. If there's anything at all that we can do, uh, we would be happy to do that. And we also have on the website all of the activities. We've moved everything from the mid-September through the end of the year. And all the dates and um, our plans for all those activities are on the websites. So please go there and then again, let us know if there's anything that you need to know. We're obviously gonna be you know, looking heavily at all this reopening and what it means for meetings. Um, several of our meetings are 20 people or less. I'm not worried about those. Uh, we have com combined uh, our meeting for our ICCA Summit and the GCIA um, uh, Culinary Combine. It's gonna be a combined event this year. It's in October, the end of October, 24th through the 27th in Portland, Oregon. So we think that was the right thing to do for everybody involved and uh, to continue to support the industry, the networking that we do. But thanks to all of you for being a part of this and we look forward to our next one.